This is Our Voices. I'm Mario Trimble. In order to be a place where everyone in our community feels valued and connected, we first have to ensure everyone believes they belong. These are Our Voices, a joint podcast production from the Colorado and Denver Bar Associations, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusivity Joint Steering Committee. Our Voices shines a light on the unique stories, experiences, and backgrounds of our member leaders so that we can help each other walk together. Judge Melina Hernandez was a magistrate in the Denver Juvenile Court and a family court facilitator in the Denver District Court before her recent appointment to the Arapahoe County Court. A graduate of the University of Denver Sturm College of Law, Judge Hernandez has served as a coordinator for the Colorado Judicial Domestic Relations Institute, a member of the Denver Metro Domestic Violence Fatality Review Committee, and is co-chair of the Colorado Women's Bar Association Diversity and Inclusion Committee. Our own Linda Moss and Mallory Revel sat down with Judge Hernandez and talked with her about growing up in Colorado, her path to the bench, and her perspectives on everything from how the light rail can be a form for forging friendships to the power of mentorships and the importance of ensuring our courts meet those they serve as they are. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our podcast. Today, we are meeting with Magistrate Melina Hernandez of Denver. I'm Mallory Revel, criminal defense attorney with Foster Graham, Milstein, and Kalisher. With me today is my co-host, Linda Moss, with Coombe, Curry, Rich, and Jarvis. Welcome, Magistrate Hernandez. Thank you so much for having me, Light Rail Buddy. Light Rail Buddy. So why don't you tell us that story? I assumed start. that's why uh, you called me. <laughs> Other than your many accomplishments that we would like to discuss today. But let's start with the Light Rail. Tell us about that. So for the cheap seats... Mallory reached out to me via email and then we spoke on the phone yesterday and we were preparing for this meeting a little bit and she said oh and that's how we met on the light rail and I said oh you're light rail Mallory (laughs) so we used to ride the same light rail it had to be at least for a couple of years and several months if not one year before we actually spoke to each other and we're both really fast walkers so it was this really interesting social experiment of (laughs) how long can two lawyers ride the light rail on the same route every day at the same time and walk the same four blocks and not speak with each other and i think so a year was the record we we had a record it was a good run but then when we started talking to each other we realized how much we had in common and you had something big that you were um, getting ready to do and so that's how mallory and i really know each other and then we reconnected through cobalt and now here we are in this recording studio so that is the type of person that magistrate hernandez is she's the (laughs) friendly approachable person on the light rail that you just walk up to and randomly talk to and we still figure it out years later (laughs) (laughs) a testament to her personality (laughs) that's kind so we want to talk to you a little bit today about where you've been where you are now and what you're going to do next So let's start with where you've been. Tell us a little bit about your background, your family, and growing up. I think, maybe everybody thinks this about themselves, but I think I'm a bit of an odd duck. So I was born in Miami. My maternal side is Cuban. My paternal side is Puerto Rican. So I grew up speaking both languages. And very long story short, my mom decided that we should move to Colorado. So we went from South Miami to Canyon City, Colorado. And my memory tells me that we passed it twice before we knew that was it. (laughs) But I don't know if that really happened because I was eight. And then I grew up in Canyon City, graduated from Canyon City High School. At Canyon City High School, I learned such skills as car care maintenance, uh, four-wheeling in the hogbacks, um, where to have parties in the woods. Don't do that. (laughs) Have those factored into being a magistrate? (laughs) I don't want to talk about that. So the next question (laughs) was, so then I graduated from Canyon City High School, moved to Boulder, and it was just a a totally different world for me. Boulder changed me in so many ways, but uh, I put myself through college because there wasn't that kind of money, but you could back then you could wait tables and put yourself through undergrad. I don't think that's the case anymore. Um, 
So weighted tables, some of my best friends are my table waiting friends. That was our <laughs> sorority slash fraternity. That's wow. how, that's who we know. That's who we connect with. Probably my oldest friends are people I waited tables with. And then... Um, it's so funny how those people follow you through life. Some of my absolute best friends are also people I waited tables with in college. Why do you think that is? Why do those Why do those relationships years later still I, matter so much? I think, and this is going to go into the, the things we're going to talk about next, but if you're working 40 hours a week, you're not in clubs. You're not in a sorority. You're not volunteering. You're feeding yourself. So you have, that's, that's your family that you choose. Or maybe don't choose. Maybe you don't want to wait are tables. Are thrust and you, into. Yeah, are thrust <laughs> into. So I think that's why. I mean, if you spend 40 hours a week with people, it's probably as much time as you spent with your family during your high school years, you know? So you become really close. And I think those are formative years. So what do you think? I would agree. I mean, it's it's literally a family that you're kind of thrust into some you willingly lose touch with and Mm -hmm. there's a select few that you're still friends with years and years later because nobody's seen you at that level of desperation (laughs) i mean do you make 213 an hour i make 213 an hour girl you know okay so 213 did you too yeah something like that so yeah 213 an hour and tips so you have to be kind to survive but these are the people who see you in the kitchen just unraveling (laughs) So they know you. <laughs> yeah. So how did we get from unraveling in the kitchen in college to law school? Uh, I unraveled in law school too, but I don't want <laughs> So fair. <laughs> so let's see. Undergrad was really a lesson in me trusting people who knew me and cared about me and were looking out for me. I was a psychology major, I think like everybody is, and I had (laughs) one professor who took interest and said, you know, I think you would be good at sociology. I think that would really suit you. And I didn't know what it was, but I knew it was a a major that everybody said was easy. So I was attracted to it because (laughs) I worked 40 hours a week and Mm. was going to school, but also because I thought the subject matter might be interesting. Mm -hmm. It was an easy sell. I then found a professor Dr. Joanne Belknap, who's going to retire this year. Thank you, Dr. Belknap, for everything that you did for me. You changed my life. Um, Who took me on uh, as a teacher's assistant, assistant, excuse me, after I took one of her classes and introduced me to um, Project Safeguard and the work they were doing to end intimate partner abuse. And I started out as an intern for Project Safeguard in 2005. And I'm still a part of, it's not the same organization, but the Denver Domestic Violence Fatality Review Board. And I was I was going there 15 years ago. So that changed my life. And I knew that I wanted to further my education because there were no jobs at the sociology store to steal a joke. <laughs> and um, so I went into law school with the mind to do something macro that would help and violence against children and families. And I went to, I can make this story really long, but I'll try not to. I went to a panel first year of law school and there was a man there who was the executive director of Colorado Legal Services. And I said, you know, I know I wanna do something in this. What job is that? And he said, oh, come talk to me afterward. And John Asher is still the executive director of Colorado Legal Services. He is my conscience, he is my friend, he is my heart. Um, he just had so much heart and he's so ethical and he really sees this profession as a means for improving people's lives and keeping our promise of access to justice, but also keeping our promise of actual justice. So it's not enough to have an office. You actually have to make sure that people then get justice. He puts up with me and my dumb questions and and me trying to figure out what I want to be when I grow up. So I met him early in law school, which was really lucky because he helped sort of steer me in the right direction of things that were meaningful to me. Um, And law school was tough. I'm not one of those people who who really found my place there. I struggled and struggled and struggled. I found it very difficult. I found it very lonely. I found the culture so different from undergrad. 
uh, it was hard for me, but I also made incredible friends there. So I have that to look back on. And I didn't die. <laughs> so, <laughs> such an important lesson. Thank you won't you. die. <laughs> I, too, struggled a lot in law school. I mean, it's an identity crisis. You go from college and being the straight A student and kind of, you know, a big deal and a little campus in my situation to a bigger law school where I was completely lost and kind of lost my identity a little bit. I've reflected a lot on what advice I would give someone in that position, and I've never, <laughs> I've never come up with it other than persevere. What would you tell a law student who's currently in law school, struggling to find their place, and law school just isn't coming intuitively to them? There are people, I would tell them, one, there are people for whom law school is very natural. That's not any indication of what the practice of law will be like for them. Two, ask for help. I think that my shame about not knowing the answers and really have, I just didn't know what was going on. It felt, I mean, I passed, so I <laughs> figured out something, but I think the shame of going into, I should have been in office hours, five hours a week because there were people there to help me, but I just had never needed help before and I didn't know how to do it. And I guess three would be find a mentor, find a lawyer or a law student who shows you who and how you want to be. And unless that person tells you to, you know, blocks your number, just keep, <laughs> just keep de depending on them because sometimes we just need somebody else to lift us up. And it is, it can be, this practice can be lonely too. And, and finding the right people I think is really important. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that advice is extremely applicable to the practice of law as well. Ask questions if you feel like you're, not really understanding what you're doing and find a good mentor. Even if even if you're not a brand new attorney, it's still important to have mentors. Absolutely. And, you know, not wear one person out. Have a few people that you can depend upon, but <laughs> spread the neediness around. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But there there are a lot of people out there who really want to help you and just let them because it's so much harder. I agree with you. I agree with you, Linda. That's a great point. Speaking of finding your people, tell us about who you found when you got out of law school um, to kind of start your career and start leaving your footprints. Well, I didn't find anything initially <laughs> because I, and I know you did too, Mallory, I graduated in 2011, which I think was one of the worst years to graduate. <laughs> Uh, so I passed the bar, which was incredible, and then I couldn't find a job. And then this um, Career Development Center, Eric Bono at the Career Development Center at DU, bless him also, thank you, Eric, <laughs> uh, wouldn't leave me alone and kept trying to get me to apply for um, an externship through their program. And it was, you know, minimal pay because the school's paying for it. And I found a gig in Castle Rock with Judge Cross, who is retired now. He's incredible. And I worked there for a few months, and one of the magistrates in Castle Rock said, oh, hey, there, there's this um, judge in Denver. He wants uh, an, a law clerk who's in interested in domestic relations. Would you be interested in that? Yes, I would be interested in that. I work a mile away from the Denver District Court instead of 20 from Castle Rock, and I really want to do domestic relations, which I know was unusual then. And this judge really wanted a Spanish-speaking law clerk because they had so many people coming into the office. In Denver, it's about 30% monolingual non-English speakers. So it's a third of our docket. It's a, it's a ton. People were coming in, and they needed help, and they didn't speak English. So part of my interview was being asked a question by the clerk, Nancy, in Spanish. And so that's how I ended up being now Justice Hood's law clerk, <laughs> which is the dumb, luckiest. <laughs> My life is just a series of probably just dumb luckiness. Um, so I worked for Justice Hood for a few months. A family court facilitator position opened up. I wasn't going to apply for it. He said, what's wrong with you? <laughs> I said, well, you know, I promised you a year. He said, if this is about a personal decision, I respect your personal decisions. If this is about staying with me for a year, you need to apply for that job. I'm still a family court facilitator. I've been there in that position since February of 2013. And I've been a magistrate since uh, late March, early April of 2017. And so the courts have been my home pretty much my entire career. Which is remarkable. 
One theme that we're finding in this podcast is the number of people that have even unknowingly blazed the trail ahead for us and made impacts on people that have later made impacts on us. Justice Hood mentored one of my mentors, Lara Baker, and the wisdom that she gives to me that she credits to him, it's, it's everything trickles down in a way that's really powerful. Yes. And he is a really good mentor and a great writer. He's the one who taught me to write orders instead of saying the court, uh, the court finds the court. You just say, I had a hearing with the parties on September 29th, 2020. At that hearing, I heard their testimony. Mom said X, Y, and Z. Dad said A, B, and C. I now conclude, but plain language, I mean, he was part of my foray into plain language, which I could also talk about for 20 minutes, but I won't. Um, Ms. Baker's already talked to me about (laughs) writing simply many, many times, and that is from him. Um, Have you been able to kind of give back to younger attorneys all of the mentorship that you've received over the years? Have you been able to have some kind of mentorship role now that you're in a position to? Most of my mentorship now, I'll be honest, is with our law clerks. So working at the courts, you get a constant influx of new law clerks, and they're there for about a year, sometimes two years. And you just kind of connect them with somebody who you know who is interested in the things that they're interested in. I have um, a couple of young students, one college student now for law school, si se puede, If I see a young person who has questions, I just give them my phone number and I ask them to please text me. Don't leave a voicemail because I won't. (laughs) I won't check it. So, yeah, it's it's nice. And it also keeps you young. I mean, they're so much more thoughtful about things that we had to take college classes for. They just know these things intuitively or they're socialized to know these things. Like what? One of our clerks said to me, she said, it's really important that uh, you and Lisa are Latinas and you have magistrate jobs because that's important for me to have in my life so that it can be modeled for me. <laughs> and I thought, okay. <laughs> and then I looked back and I thought, I didn't have that. I don't think my colleague Lisa had that either. And just the idea that representation matters or the way that they're so much better at some of these things that we're all still learning. You know how our generation is slowly starting to add our pronouns to the bottom Mm -hmm. of an email. Young people can handle a pronoun. Just, they just weave in and out of it flawlessly. It's just a lot more natural for them. So all these things that we've clunkily come to educate ourselves about, um, I think they're just better about it. I'm at my gym, my friend's daughter, she's 18. She's voting in her first election And she's following the candidates. She's watching, she's been watching these um, debates for, I don't know, how many years have they been going on now? (laughs) But she knows what she wants and she's on campus trying to get people involved and trying to make sure that everybody votes. I, I voted when I was 18 or 19, but I was nowhere near as informed. So I think social media keeps them informed. I think they're more um, culturally and cognitively diverse than we were. And they lack what some of us used to call manners, but it's these formalities that I Mm. think that stopped us from really talking about important things. Sure. I think they just kind of like blow past that because they know that, you know, what is lost is less than what's gained. Is that Mm. a good answer? It's a great answer. Okay. (laughs) Thank you for that. Yeah. And representation mattering really seamlessly brings us into the next area that we want to talk to you about. Who are you now? So tell us about your experience on the bench and the work that you're doing there. So I love my job. I have two jobs and I think the court facilitator job gets short shrift, but you're in a room usually with two parties in Denver, 80% of the time, 90% of the time they're unrepresented. To be clear, we're not in rooms now. It's on the phone right now. Um, but people are explaining what about the process they don't understand. They're deep in their conflict. They're fresh in their conflict. And you don't have a robe or a courtroom, so they are less reserved with you. And it can make it hard, but it can also make it a lot easier to get to what the issues are. 
Uh, and then that's all transferred into the magistrate job, which is similar. So I have a paternity establishment and child support docket. So then the magistrate docket is me. It's a, it's kind of an invasive process. So somebody applies for child support services or they apply for a benefit from the state. And if it's the mom, which it usually is, she's filling out a form called an affidavit of paternity. And the first question is, what's your name? Second question is, what's your kid's name? Whose name does the father on the birth certificate? And then the fourth or fifth question is, who'd you have sex with within this 90-day window? <laughs> name everyone. Oh, wow. And it's just a little bit vulnerable. And then the other questions are, have you ever been married? Um, has anybody ever introduced themselves as your child's parent, et cetera, et cetera? Sure. So you have to ask people really private questions in a courtroom setting and try to get the truth. And there are a lot of reasons that people might not want to be honest. There are a lot of reasons that it's just humiliating. Um, there are, you know, women who are survivors of sexual assault. Um, there are men who just found out that they had a kid and their kid is older. And you have to give them a little bit of dignity and also power through this, this pretty heavy docket. So, I, I don't know. I think the things that I pulled from that docket is everybody really wants to get it right. Nobody walks in there and is ambivalent about how they present their case. It's just that I think the system is a little bit hostile, hostile to how people sort of naturally negotiate things. And this is really emotional. It can be heartbreaking. There's a lot of betrayal involved sometimes. Um... But also people are really funny and kind. And when I get, you know, cases with older, especially Latinos, they always look at me like they're proud of me. And when I was first starting and I was a little <laughs> bit clunky, they would sort of nod with me <laughs> as I was getting through the advisement. Like, you they're can like, do yeah, it. This is a it. very good advisement. <laughs> 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 so it was just so heartwarming. And, you know, people mostly say thank you or if they stumble, I'll just say thank take a minute, you know, you can have mm -hmm. a minute. Um, so I don't know. It's taught me that kindness can go a long way. The people are really funny and that people, we're all just doing our best and courthouses are scary. <laughs> so yeah, that's my job now. Thank you for yeah. sharing about that. Um, you mentioned, you know, the feeling that people are kind of rooting for you. Um, that see you on the bench, especially when you were younger. Tell us a little bit about the work that you've done, uh, specifically with the Colorado Women's Bar, mm -hmm. to help foster diversity, equity, and inclusion in the bar. Gladly. Uh, so now I'm just um, a member of the committee, but last year I was one of the co-chairs for the, we called it D and I initially, but now I think it's called Diver DEI, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, Ruchi Kapoor and, <laughs> oh, Guzman. Is it Christine Guzman? I'm sorry I messed up her name. But they're running it now, and they're focused on four or five basic things. But um, one of the projects they're working on that I'm most interested in is Pipeline. And part of the reason we have underrepresentation of certain cultures, identities, able, ability, et cetera, is because we don't have those young people knowing what an attorney is, what their future can look like, and, and that there are jobs available to them. Um, I mean, my partner has a master's in physics. He's like, I didn't really know what a lawyer did. I thought, well, if you don't know, <laughs> you know. So, um, so the pipeline issue is near and dear to my heart. And I remember diversity efforts even 10 years ago looked a lot like hey, you look different, but you have something to add. And I just remember thinking, yeah, I, I know. So mm. it, they were a little, they were new. And DEI in the legal field was getting its sea legs. But I had a concern that we were inviting young people into law school and into the legal field, but not actually creating a space for them where they felt, um, I mean, even being a woman in law school not that long ago was a big deal. So, but I think the way that the legal field has improved so much, and I was listening to this podcast, this woman named Diane Miles, she does um, 
she has a creative content company down in Colorado Springs. She, she said that people would reach out to her and say, hey, I want to market to this community. And she would say, well, what are you doing for the community? Why would I help you sell them something if you're not going to give anything back? And she was much more articulate about identifying my concern, which is, yes, we have to invite young people into the legal field, especially young people who are from um, different backgrounds and who have different ways of thinking. But then we can't make law school this uber traditional hostile place where we haze them, we don't mentor them, we don't support them. And then they end up leaving the legal field with quarter of a million dollars of debt. I mean, it's irresponsible for us to bring people into that kind of debt and not create a place for them. Um, and we're starting to create a place for them. Like it really matters. We're really giving people like that a voice. COBOL, the Colorado Bar Association Leadership Training, there are a lot of attorneys of difference in that group and they're going places, they're leaders, they're gonna be people. And so we're getting it now. And I'm really excited about that. And I think pipeline, the beginning of the pipeline and the end of the pipeline uh, are equally important. I think we're walking that walk now. And I've never been more excited to be a lawyer. And I know that sounds cheesy, but it's real. That's fantastic. You mentioned COBOL. Tell mm -hmm. me a little bit yeah. more about the importance of COBOL to you. So I hope no one takes offense to this, but when people told me about COBOL, I thought, that sounds like the Illuminati. <laughs> <laughs> like, not in cobalt, and it still sounds like it. Right. An image that we're purposefully trying to yeah. get away from, oh, by the way. Oh, it's going to change your life. <laughs> oh, you're going to meet so many amazing people. You can't describe it. I'm like, please describe it. What's happening? <laughs> so uh, cobalt is um, a selected group of 20 I was going to say very young attorneys, but probably whatever age I am, attorneys who are about the age that I am. And it's a, it's been all messed up this year because of, um, it has been messed up because of COVID, but just think, maybe think back on months? your January. Yeah, yeah. Six months. Think back on your January experience and maybe, maybe share with us kind of the most important thing that you took away from the initial session in January. Okay. That's, that's a great place to start. So there are 20 of us. Uh, we met at this um, hotel. Were there one night or two nights? Two. two. Thank you. Uh, Mallory was there. <laughs> and, and it's different presenters on different subjects. So one was Justice Monica Marquez. One was Judge Teresa Spahn. We had a few other speakers, but then we also participated in something called Emergenetics, which is sort of a personality test. And I know there are different versions of them and I know it sounds like Illuminati. <laughs> it doesn't help with the Illuminati image, but it's really worthwhile. It's really so what worthwhile. Did you learn so from it's that? this multi question test that you take, and then it spits out this profile that you have, and it teaches you how you communicate, how you learn, how you conceptualize things. And there are four colors. And um, they sort of taught us how we all, all how we fit together and they would put us in different rooms or different groups and give us different assignments. And then they would reorganize, shuffle the groups and give us another different assignment. But one, we didn't really know each other. So it gave us a way to learn more about each other. Two, it gave us a way to apply those lessons to other people in our lives and in our careers. So if somebody seems standoffish, it could just be because this is their personality type. Or if somebody's taking copious amounts of notes, Kara Nord, if you're listening, um, it's because that's how they synthesize information. And it really makes you empathetic to others, but one, understand, or, but also understanding of yourself. So I... My circle is almost entirely red, which means I'm <laughs> only social. I basically just sit here and be social all day. I don't know what I think <laughs> about or plan for or do or how I organize my life. And that's carried through to the other programming. But the other programming is figuring out what kind of an attorney you want to be, how you're going to negotiate with others, how you plan your career, how you plan um, your social life. And it's essentially, it feels like all of the best parts of college, not the professor education but the education where you're just taking in all this information and th synthesizing it and when you make your smoothie in the morning you're thinking about mm -hmm. how that applies to who you are as a person but it's just another opportunity to really learn um with a bunch of people who are 
in the same situation as you. It really does. It feels like college in all the best ways. It's a great program. I never thought of it as analogous to college in that level of enlightenment. I love that. That's a great analogy. But do you remember leaving philosophy class and just thinking, (gasps) (laughs) (laughs) so yeah, it's been a great experience. So you talked about being red, which is social Mm -hmm. in that personality. How do you think that's affected you and how you approach your job as a magistrate? Well, I think the downside of it is that I probably present as less intelligent than I am. It's like, oh, what a nice lady, you know, which is not necessarily what I want to convey. But and I I don't think that I'm what a judicial officer seems like to at least the picture that we have in our minds or the picture that some people have in their minds or something like that. I'm not terribly stoic I'm not um I'm not impulsive and I listen and I'm measured but I'm not I I respond to people when they talk when they feel when they say things when they interrupt I respond to them and it's there's there's a little bit more of a back and forth the way that I think it's helped me is that People are more likely to tell me the truth. I think people feel more comfortable yelling at me, which I totally don't mind because usually that's when you're getting most of the best information, whether it's this person is yelling at me because the thing that's most important just came up and I have to put, I have to revere that. I have to acknowledge that or else we're never going to get anywhere in this case. Um, But also I think, I hope, I hope that people can come to court and say, oh, that's that lady was nice to me and she's just a regular lady and she explained it to me. I My dream is that people go into the court and they walk out feeling that this is theirs just as much as it's an attorney's who has, you know, a $2,000 suit on. Um, so that's what I hope the social aspect does. There are downsides. Well, you mentioned not being kind of the traditional picture of the stoic judicial officer. I'm not going to approach that person on the light rail. (laughs) Why is that important to rewrite what a judicial officer looks like? I don't think, I don't necessarily think that it's important to rewrite it, but I do think that it's important that judicial officers can adapt to their courtrooms and their litigants uh, because Maintaining decorum is one thing that a judicial officer is responsible for, and establishing the credibility of the court is another thing that we're responsible for. And people have to be confident that you can read, understand, and synthesize the law into an order. So, you know, there is that piece. I also think that some litigants want a stoic judicial officer. I think that some attorneys want a stoic judicial officer. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And some judicial officers who appear to be quite stoic stoic are actually really warm and lovely people. That's just (laughs) how they act on the bench. And there there are also generational reasons for that. Um, There are reasons that women act like that more than men, especially when it came to being taken seriously. So... Not necessarily rewrite it, but there's there's room for a lot. I think because if you're really stoic in a domestic relations courtroom or a paternity establishment courtroom, people just look at you and, I mean, Kendrick Lamar got a Pulitzer. One of the things he talks about is how judges don't care about people like him. Mm. That's a problem. Um, so I think it's important that litigants look up at the bench and see somebody who is listening to them, who is hearing them, and who hasn't already decided who that person is. Um. Yeah. And I don't remember if Mallory mentioned this at the beginning, but I'm a domestic relations attorney. And so I know that experience. They're scared, even if they're yelling and they seem like they know what they're talking about. They're really scared. And so I'm sure it's extremely important to them to feel that the person hearing their case sees them and hears what they're saying and thinks that what they're saying is important. Um, But I'm curious to know, too, you said that you have a perception that the way that you act may make people think that you're less intelligent because you're effusive and 
you talk and you, you know, seem friendlier. Do you feel that you've, that that's affected the way that you act as a magistrate or have you modified your behavior at all based on that perception? The answer is yes. And it was appropriate because when you're, I was used to working with mostly unrepresented litig litigants, and I don't want to say that I was overly casual, but I was more familiar with them because I thought that was more approachable. And then when I started working as a magistrate, we would have um, almost every mother and father was unrepresented, but then we would have a city attorney from the Department of Human Services. And you know, they paid their quarter million dollars to go to law school. They have read the law. They understand um, procedure and opening statements and direct and cross and how things should work. So, yeah, you do have to adapt so that everybody respects the courtroom and everybody knows that the courtroom is um, a place where everybody gets treated with dignity. And, you know, I have there's an attorney for the Department of Human Services. She always interrupts me. <laughs> always interrupts me but it's not malicious she's just an interrupter so all right so I adapt because you know the the attorney whom I love who is interrupting is here and then I have litigants who always interrupt me they always interrupt me so you got to be flexible you got to be adaptable but at the same time we do need to revere the system and the process because it's good and it really does work but it's a lot less cut and dried than mm -hmm. I'm sure we all thought it was when we first walked into a courtroom. Speaking of walking into courtrooms, mm -hmm. is there any kind of courtroom that you would like to next walk into? Uh, yes, is the answer to that. I I love my job and I hesitate because it part of me feels like it would be a betrayal to leave my Spanish speakers in Denver or um, to leave the incredible people with whom I work at the juvenile court uh, but that's an ego trip also we have a pipeline and we have a bunch of young attorneys who can do this work just as well or better than i can uh, i would love to be a county court judge i i like the people the cross-section of the people and i like the idea that people walk into a courthouse as they are and i kind of think of county court is um like a medical clinic mm -hmm. where it's like you're sick, you have an ailment, we have to figure out a way to get you in and out, treat you, um, and make sure you walk out of here healthier than when you got in here. And I, I love, I mean, the law's really like that too. We are, we're the doctors of the law. We have to make sure that it does its job. So yeah, I think county court's where it's at. Maybe one day, you know, 20, 30, 40 years down the road, I could do an appellate court, but what about any kind of specialty courts? Do you have any passions as it relates to specialty courts, either existing or in the future? I would like to just do a Spanish-only courtroom. I think I think now is the time. I think the iron is hot because the state has $56 million in budget cuts. We um, had to let go of really important, crucial people on our staff. Our courtroom interpreters are buried. In Denver, I think we have fewer than 20 interpreters for the entire and they cover the entire metro area and they have to pay to park so and they have to pay to park yeah we don't have we don't have anywhere for them to park i mean look at look at downtown denver we have a couple of surface lots uh and it's expensive i mean parking is it used to be you know when we were riding the light rail parking was five or six bucks there a was day. a reason why we were riding the light yes, rail yes ma'am there was <laughs> <laughs> but if we had if we had spanish-speaking judicial officers. We already have cases in which both parties are Spanish speaking and both parties can't afford an attorney. The hearings could be a third shorter, 50% shorter, if they could just do everything in Spanish. We need a rule change. I'm not proposing anything illegal. There would need to be a rule change, but um, Texas did it in a drug court and People were giving surveys of their judicial officers talking about how much they liked their judge, mm -hmm. which is not something that we can expect. People were using less, people were more involved, and they were having better outcomes. 
a uh, judge did it in Washington and I called her on the phone because I just thought maybe she'll maybe she'll answer if I mm-hmm. call her. Um, let's see. Uh, Veronica Alicea Galvan. She was in Washington in county court, had a busy docket. The interpreter was late and she just asked the person if they spoke Spanish and they said yes. So she just did the hearing in Spanish and kind of thought, well, if I'm in trouble, they'll let me know. Um, and had a Spanish speaking court for a long time until she moved up to an appellate court. So we can do it. We can afford it. And it's just, I think, I mean, even in a, a politically tense time, saving money, serving more people, doing it more quickly, and doing WebEx hearings with an interpreter is hard for everybody. Oh, yeah. You've done it? I haven't, but I can, it, doing a hearing in person with an interpreter is difficult. So I imagine by WebEx it must be. The signals are bad. It can't be. Um, it can't be simultaneous because it it's hard and it's yeah. hard on everybody. And it just makes. I don't know. It's just a clunkiness that we could resolve. So yeah, Spanish speaking court. That's what I want to do. Great idea. And when you say that the litigants um, were, you know, entering surveys saying that they like their judicial officer. Do you think it's just because of the relief they were feeling at like having a judicial officer who could speak their language and actually understand what they were talking about? I think so. I'll I'll speculate the reasons that I suspect and then talk to somebody who knows more about it than I do. But sure. um, I don't think we're sensitive enough to the fact that when you're interpreting, you're not interpreting word for word, you're interpreting concepts. So sometimes you have to hear three or four parts of a phrase before you understand what you're saying. So it's not exactly simultaneous. Mm-hmm. There's a slight delay. Um, if proceedings are going too fast, interpreters m- have to triage words. So then they're getting concepts. Mm-hmm. And you're actually not getting the same hearing. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can express yourself better in your language. I have plenty yeah. of litigants in the court facilitator job who speak English well enough to get through a status conference. But when I ask them if they want to do it in Spanish, they're like, oh, yeah. yes, and I'm getting 10 times more information, important information. So, yeah, I, I think it matters. I, I always imagine it this way. What if I went abroad and I got arrested in Italy? Sure, I could sort of understand what was happening. I actually got a driving ticket in Italy. But we don't have to talk <laughs> about that. Um, yeah, sure, you can understand what's happening and the outcome will be fair, but we can make it extra fair. Yeah, so and I'm sure there better. must be a trust barrier there where you're already in this situation. I mean, being in a courtroom, you already don't trust the people around you. And then if you're going through an interpreter and you don't know what it is that they're telling the judge, I'm sure that makes it extremely difficult to trust the judicial process. Yes, and imagine... A lot of litigants get stuck because they speak enough English to have a conversation or do their particular job. So sometimes the interpreter will interpret something differently than they would have wanted, and then they correct the interpreter, and then the judicial officer says, what's going on here? <sighs> and it's you're, it's it's tough, and you have to either use an interpreter or not use an interpreter in most courtrooms. So you're either fully dependent on that interpreter or really optimistic that you can do it yourself yeah that's a good point so you have a great big picture long-term goal um what else would you like to accomplish and any part that i can play in the courts becoming a place that people feel they're a part of is important if i could get people excited about jury duty i'm sure you're nodding if I could get people about, excited about it, jury duty, I have these lectures like, the system doesn't work without you. <laughs> there are actually four branches of government. The people are the fourth. Get out of there. Um, and then I just want to be happy. I would like to retire in Palm Springs and sing karaoke once a week um, and have leathery tan skin um, <laughs> and, yeah, serve the the last years of my life by a pool somewhere. But just helping people access the system, making it better, and being as happy and as kind as I can muster. You are known for having good stories, I will tell you. Can you tell me your favorite story from law school? 
I mean, probably not. This is recorded. (laughs) (laughs) My partner, he said, the only piece of advice I'm going to give you is don't tell any jokes that won't age well. All right. I have a couple. So the one from law school is um, on this passing period, I would always see this same guy. And I think we were both red circles. We were both social. So we would just sort of nod at each other. And then we would eventually say hi to each other and he became my what's up guy so for probably has had to at least be a semester he was my what's up guy and then I was at the career development center and I see the what's up guy and he says hi what's up you know I was like what's up I'm Melina and he said oh I'm Chris Chris Michael for anybody who is listening who knows him and he said, my friends and I are going to get drinks at Jordan's, which is no longer there after this. Do you want to come? And I said, yeah, my friends and I were going to get drinks at Jordan's anyway. And then my what's up guy calls three or four days later saying, hey, my buddy won a house in Montana at the public interest law group auction. It sleeps 14. He um, had too many drinks and overbid on it. Do you want to come? It'll be one hundred and forty dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I said, wow, uh, I said, I don't know. I might have to move some money around. Let me ask my friend. <laughs> yeah, you starving law student. Yeah. You're like, oh, yeah, I have $140. $140? You mean two <laughs> like, months naturally. of pizza? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so I called my friend, and she said, oh, and I told him, I said, but I'm not driving. And I called my friend, and I told her, I said, hey, my what's up guy won a cabin at the public interest law group, or his friend did. Anyway, do you want to go? And she said, yeah, but I'm not driving. Let me move some money around. So (laughs) we ended up going to Yellowstone National Park three or four days later, and there were, I think, five of us in the car. And it was just one of those things that only happens when, you know, you happen to have $140 and an extra weekend free. That was pretty great. Wow. Yeah. All right, so we are out of time. Thank you so much, Melina, for being here with us today. It's been such a pleasure to get to know you better, be on the light rail level, um, and hear about your experiences and your journey. And thank you for sharing with us. Thank you so much for having me. This was great. Thank you for keeping it light. Yeah, have a good one. And thank Thank you, you. This has been Our Voices. For more information on today's guest, or to get involved, please check out the CBA podcast page at cobar.org slash podcast. That's C-O-B-A-R dot org slash podcast. This podcast series was created by members of the Colorado and Denver Bar Associations. Our Voices is a collaborative effort of the EDI Joint Steering Committee messaging team, including Mallory Rebel, Linda Moss, Bonnie Schreiner, Mallory Hasbrook, Mo Watson, Mario Trimble, Courtney Holm, and Emmy Lopez, with our CBA Communications Team Director, Heather Fulker, and Manager, Charles McGarvey. Our recording engineer is Rick Pontelion of Lionsbridge Recording. Our producer and editor is Courtney Holm, with theme and introduction by Mario Trimble. This podcast is made possible because of the support of the Colorado and Denver Bar Associations. On behalf of all of us, thanks for listening to Our Voices.